Hello and welcome to Your Climate Future. This session is hosted by Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and supported by the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. In this episode, you are going to hear from our Climate Action Officer, Richard Gilmore, about the things that community groups can do in order to lead the fight against the climate emergency. And we also have a very special guest who we're very excited about. You're going to hear from Dr. Tara Shine, who's going to share some of her experiences and insights on what you can do at home in order to make a real difference. But first, we have a really interesting presentation from our Climate Action Officer, Richard Gilmore. Richard, take it away. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for Your Climate Future. My name is Richard Gilmore from Keep Nord Now and Beautiful, and I will be here hosting this uh, short session we have here for you for the next 30 or 40 minutes, where we'll be looking at the impacts of climate change, what's causing it, but most importantly, what you as an individual and as a member of your community can do about it to make a positive difference, both for now and for future generations to come. Uh, just a quick word from our partnerships that we've been working with here to bring you this training here today. Uh, we at Keep Nord Now and Beautiful are incredibly indebted to the Department of Agricultural, Environmental and Rural Affairs. Their funding is what allowed us to put this training together and to bring it to you people here then today. We're incredibly thankful for that there. And to keep the training and our presentations to the highest standard possible, we've been working closely together with the Carbon Literacy Project in order to maintain and ensure these standards. We're incredibly thankful to be working with them and we hope to do so more so in the future as well. And a brief word about who we are as a local Northern Irish environmental charity. Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful have been operating for decades and we have four key key strategic aims that we aim to achieve in order to protect our local environment, as the case may be. Uh, one key focus, of course, then, is on biodiversity recovery. We've already lost so many animals and insects in our natural world. We aim to protect and preserve what we have already and hopefully recapture and bring back many that have been lost. And as a key function of doing that there, and our second key uh, focus is on habitat pr preservation and reintroduction as well, be that from bogs, peatlands, hedgerows or farmlands, whatever the case may be, so long as we can carve out a space for nature and protect it, that will facilitate the recovery of, of our biodiversity. And if we're protecting that natural land, it feeds in very much then our third point about waste and plastic pollution solutions. We are uh, we specialize in ensuring that if we have this protected area then, then we need to make sure it's not filled with trash. So we have many programs dedicated to making sure that we can take trash away from that there and help protect that natural area as well then. And again, as a key function of ensuring and understanding why we care about that natural world, that's why we focus so much on environmental education, especially through our Eco Skills program, so that we can reach young people in both primary and secondary schools, so that we can help engage their involvement with the natural world and help them remember why we care about it in the first place. And last but not least then, as a function of that education, we have myself and what we're delivering here today, looking at uh, climate action, where we address the questions around climate change, what's causing it, and most importantly, what we can do about it here then. So as a part of that there, we have many, many different projects that feed into all of these key strategic areas then, from our adopter spots where we can help people to go out and clean their local areas, to our eco skills program to, in order to bring that environmental educational programs to young people at their schools, or it could be our blue and green flags which help protect and preserve our natural environments. If you if you're interested in any of our projects, please go onto our website at www.keepnordnowandbeautiful.org. If anything seems uh, intriguing to you, you want to get involved with it, let us know. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And as I was saying beforehand, we are massively indebted to the work of the Carbon Literacy Project. They themselves are an environmental charity based over in Manchester, over in England, and they are an internationally recognized organization for the transformative work that they have been doing over the many years for transforming the impact of environmental education, especially around carbon literacy. These are just some of the key stats they have uh, that we have on the screen here, highlighting the great work they've been doing. But the key one I really want to draw your eye to is on the bottom left there, 150,000 tons of carbon saved due to the programs that they have helped create and run 
both in the UK and all around the world. They are very, very keen of this isn't just an intellectual exercise. This isn't just theoretical knowledge. We give people the tools and knowledge they need so that they can make a difference, so they can actually do something. That 150,000 tons of CO2 saved is a direct manifestation of this is what happens when we work together. We can make a difference. We can come together and we can help tackle climate change. I hopefully will give you a little taste of that today. But if you're interested in learning more, because there's always more to learn, we also are running our carbon literacy courses, uh, which you can find more information and dates and availability completely free of charge as well. Thank you very much there, Dira. Find out more on our website again at www.keepnordenironbeautiful.org. We'd be delighted to have you on any of our training programs that would suit your needs and your times if you wish to learn more about it. But for today, one of our key take homes, what we are trying to emphasize and stress here today is we are all connected. We are all connected to the natural world on our doorstep, but we are also connected to the world and, and the biosphere and the, the biodiversity from every corner of the planet, not just in a nice, nice to know kind of sense, but in a very real, very practical sense. You hear stories or read about deforestation occurring in the Amazon or desertification occurring in the south of Italy or terrible floods that are occurring in glacial areas in Nepal or terrifying floods in New South Wales and Australia. These have a direct impact on ourselves here as well then from the prices you're paying for your food to the disruption and difficulties that we are all experiencing in these tough challenging times. We are all connected and the loss of biodiversity, the loss of natural world, and the devastation that is caused by pollution and emissions, even if it occurs on the opposite side of the world, impacts us here as well. We are not safe or secure or isolated from that there. However, and this is a key, important, positive message as well then, every bit of work we do as individuals here in Northern Ireland to help protect our own natural environment, to reduce our own emissions, everything we do to try and combat climate change, that positive effect impacts the world as well. The good work we do here can help save and preserve the natural world, and they can benefit from that all around the world as well then. So we are all connected to together. We are all in the same boat together, both for good and for ill. And our hope today, of course, then is we want much more good to come out of this here, and we very much want to reduce the ill. So how do we hope to go about that there? What can we touch upon here today then? Today, these will be our key focuses. First off, a quick primer on just how is our climate changing, and importantly, what is causing it? What does that look like specifically for ourselves here in Northern Ireland? Who needs to solve that problem? But most importantly, how can we all work together to protect our planet? I say it's a lot to cover in a very short briefing, but we aim to do our best we can here. And there's no, there's no easier way or quicker way of putting it out here. There's a fantastic line here we have from our NISRA Northern Ireland Environmental Statistics Report from 2022, put it in very stark, very clear terms. They say climate change is one of the most serious threats we face today, not only for our environment, but to our economic prosperity and global security. And it has the power to affect us no matter where we live. Again, we are not isolated. We are not in a bubble. We are all in this together. We are all connected. We cannot not ignore the effects of this here. We have to do something about it. But that's not easy. It's really not. Even, this, even though this is my day job, even though I'm teaching and talking about climate change every day is what I have to do, even I can struggle with that. It can be difficult to open up and to talk about these very real, very serious issues. But as this great quote from Dr. James McClinic here highlights beautifully is, if we can't even talk about climate change, we'll certainly never be able to fix it. So I wish to encourage every one of you here today, do talk, do ask, even if it is, I don't know, I want to learn more. That's a brilliant first step. Everything we can do to normalize these conversations and help encourage everyone to get involved with this here means we can all pitch in and make that difference. But again, it's difficult. It's hard 
to change our ways of thinking, change our lifestyles, change what we have to do, even when we know that change is necessary. We call these the dragons of inaction, the things that hold us down and stop us from making those changes or asking those questions we really need. Be it not really knowing what's this going to mean, or maybe we'll be okay in this part of the world. Yes, we're connected, but maybe we'll be okay. Or think to ourselves like, I'm so small and I'm just struggling to get by day by day. Surely the government will fix it. Surely the big organizations, they'll sort it all out. What difference can I as an individual make? I can assure you one key message we have for you here today is every single one of us, every individual here can make a difference and must make a difference to help those big movers as well. Or there is a great difficulty of like, this is a challenging, scary time in more ways than one. And we are struggling just to get by day by day. And it can be so hard. Those same strategies, everything you've been doing to keep yourself and your family safe, it can be very hard to let go of them, even if that might be necessary, even if that is the right thing we need to do in order to safeguard ourselves and future generations. It's not easy, but we're here to try and help in every way we can to help make you, let you make that first step and to make that change. So part of that there then, of course, is about understanding what the problem is as well. There, there's a lot of climate science, there's a lot you can look online as well, and that in of itself can be quite daunting. There's such a wall of information. We hope to try and break it down and make it as simple and digestible as possible for you here. So we have a quick little primer here, a quick little video highlighting some of the key information around what we mean by the carbon cycle and the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect, as very much as the name suggests, is the warming that occurs in this case specifically because of the gases that are surrounding our planet Earth. Don't get me wrong, we do need a good bit of that there. We need some natural occurring level of greenhouse gases to keep our planet warm and stop us turning into an ice ball. However, as we'll see from the video as well, while we may have a natural carbon cycle that keeps a certain level of greenhouse gases in the air to maintain a healthy, environmentally friendly level of warming, we in the past 150 years from the Industrial Revolution onwards, we as human beings have massively up upset that cycle by pumping just way too much into the atmosphere. So while we have a natural level that's good, we have way overshot that. And that's what we need to bring back. And that's what we need to fix in order to fix climate change. So let me share this very quick little video and I'll have a few more details afterwards as well. Throughout Earth's history, carbon has cycled naturally between the ocean, the biosphere and the atmosphere. This continual cycle regulates the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. CO2 and other greenhouse gases mix easily into the global atmosphere and act as a kind of blanket to trap some of the radiation reflected from the Earth's surface. This greenhouse effect keeps the planet much warmer than it would otherwise be, allowing for life on Earth to flourish. For the past few hundred thousand years, the natural carbon cycle has been in balance, keeping the concentration of atmospheric CO2 more or less constant. But with the Industrial Revolution, humans began to dig up and burn huge amounts of fossil fuels. This long buried carbon that would have taken millions of years to enter the atmosphere is now being suddenly released in a geological instant. Together with deforestation, this has upset the natural balance of the carbon cycle. Over the past 150 years, the concentration of atmospheric CO2 has risen from 270 to 400 parts per million. The higher this concentration gets, the greater the greenhouse effect becomes. As a result, the planet is warming and the Earth's surface and the ocean are heating up. This is already causing our climate to change. Unless we rapidly reduce our carbon emissions, we risk seeing more extreme weather events and other dangerous impacts in the years to come. So that's an important little primer just to give you a, a, a basic introduction to some of the key information to help us understand the effects of uh, carbon on our uh, climate. 
Now, it is worth pointing out as well then, as it mentioned at the end of that video there as well then, is we can directly observe this. We can directly measure this impact. We, If you're interested, you can always go. It's called the Keeling Curve, which you can find online. You can go online today and see what the reading is uh, to tell us how many parts per million uh, of the atmosphere contains, say, CO2 or other greenhouse gases. Uh, with We've had detailed records from 1960s onwards, but we've had records going even further back than that there. And as the video highlighted as well, while we need a certain amount of greenhouse gases to maintain a healthy eco-biosphere that we have, in just 150 years, which is nothing in the grand scheme of things, we have massively overshot that. And that is why we are seeing these impacts now today. And as it was highlighting there as well, there are many forms of greenhouse gases. For example, as we can see on the screen here, we have carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, petrofluorocarbines, and many, many others as well. Key thing to highlight this, yes, we need to reduce greenhouse gases. Ideally, if we can reduce all of these, that would be a step in the right direction. However, you would have noticed, even when we name our training, we call it carbon literacy training. The number one reason for that there is carbon dioxide is the most significant greenhouse gas by a country mile. It makes up over 75% of the overall warming effect caused by all the greenhouse gases. Key reasons for that are one, the longevity of, of CO2. It can hang, it's got a half-life in the atmosphere of up to nearly a hundred years. So once it's there, it keeps warming much longer than many of these other ones as well. And the other key factor then is sheer scale, the sheer amount that we have been pumping out into the atmosphere as pollution over the past near century and a half is why it is the number one culprit and why we focus so much on it as well. Don't get me wrong, reducing methane, hydrofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide, all of this is very important. But if we're to focus our efforts on the number one culprit the, and to create the biggest impact, that's why we focus so much on carbon dioxide there. And of course, then we can see the, the impact, we can see directly how this is increasing, but we can also see the direct impact that is having on our planet. Um, this is a fantastic little video here that NASA themselves have been able to compile together with many, many different sources of information on the average temperatures all around the globe. So to understand it, it's very simple. We're going from 1880 all the way up to 2020 of this year. And any of the cooler blue looking uh, temperature or colors that we see on the map, those are, that's positive, that's good. Those are like normal temp average temperatures or maybe even below, that's ideally what we'd want. If you see areas of yellow or red or even very dark red, those are temperatures that are going way above the average of what they should be for that year in that area. So have a look at it there and see where you can see the impacts where those yellows and reds, when they occur and where in the world they are occurring as well. Like I say, we begin over a century ago, moving ourselves in here into the 1900s. We're now getting up to the period of near World War I with a considerable level of industrial capacity increase. World War II, very much the same, massive increase in the industrial base and capacity of the world there. It's not so bad during the 60s or 70s, but from the 80s onwards and now into the 90s and the 21st century, it's not ideal. It doesn't look like it's going in the right direction. We can see lots of yellows and a massive amount of heating in the oceans, but the worst, the highest levels of average temperature heating that we can see with the red spots on the map, they're occurring not just really hard fire at far north as well, but in what should be some of the coldest regions of the planet. As you can see, the North Pole there is one of the most affected areas by uh, rising global temperatures. So there's a lot going on with that there, and it means we can directly observe the impacts we are making as humans and that, that how they can feed into the impacts on our changing climate as well. Which is why, of course, then another local environmental organization, uh, Climate Northern Ireland, they've been able to compile together a fantastic report here, outlining some of the key risks that they associate with climate change for ourselves here in Northern Ireland. Here's just some of the few factors that they highlight as potential risks and what could be happening in the future. 
biodiversity loss, both in the sea itself with fish and on the land, be it from large plants and animals to even insects themselves. And as a function of that there as well, if we're losing these animals, we're also losing their habitats that they may be in, be it wetlands, peaks, uh, bogs and forests. But beyond that there as well then, again, global warming, if that brings melting ice caps, it also means higher sea level rises, greater levels of coastal erosion. And even if you're not on the coast itself, we experience greater levels of flooding the whole way throughout Northern Ireland as well from heavier rainfalls as well. This then feeds into infrastructure damage, economic damage, which we struggle to recover from. And it also means that we as human beings are directly impacted by this here with worsening health outcomes across the board. Those are the risks they've managed to identify, but be honest with yourself, what have you already seen? What differences are we already experiencing here in Northern Ireland? These are not hypotheticals. These are not models. These are not predictions. This is the reality of what we are already dealing with. We already have hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, and more extreme weather events that are also, not only are they worse, but they're occurring more frequently than they ever did beforehand. Just for one example, Consider this here, some of the impacts that have happened. This is a quick little clip from the Derry and Straban District Council, highlighting some of the damage that has already occurred in their areas. So let me play just a brief clip of this here for you. From an operational point of view, from working on the ground, we're seeing the signs of it. We're seeing these temperatures where we're having to cut the grass uh, in February, where we're gritting in April. We're having to go out and deal with a flood one day, and the next day we're having to deal with problems that the sun are causing. There are trees blown down in the parks, there are trees blown down in the Forestry Commission, and there are trees blown down along pedestrian routes. That in itself shows you that there's a reaction to the weather. The rain was on heavy all day. At half ten at night it really came down to within an hour, I would say the place was flooded. There was nothing anybody could do. The smell. Oh, the devastation was unbelievable. Everybody was just standing in disbelief. We're really pleased that there was nobody down the ground at the time uh, because the water was up to sort of six or eight feet high all around the ground. The flooding came down from the, the hills, the spirons. As a result, this farmland and the surrounding area was all badly flooded. In total, we lost about 70,000 plus. My mum's dining room suite, that was 70 year old. It was destroyed. Lots of other things that we had for years and years, and you just had to let them go. I think this is one of the worst things I've ever, ever had to see. It's not very nice having this happen to you. Indeed. And you, were, you may have been very eagle-eyed to notice as well then. This report, this video was coming from uh, 2018, nearly four years ago. Things, it wasn't a one-off. It wasn't just that that year was particularly bad. These are all part of a long-term trend that is indicative of our changing climate and what we are having to adapt to as well. As we say, our, we are all interconnected. We are all affected by changes occurring all around the planet. And that means for ourselves here as well, considering just last year, 2022, the UK Met Office themselves have declared that every month, with the exception of December, was hotter than average. We had record-breaking temperatures across the country, or even if you look further afield into Europe itself, they were setting record heat waves as well. As the Met Office themselves here as well, is that these figures are in line with the genuine impacts we expect as a result of human-induced climate change. And again, something I think that gets forgotten so often is when we talk about unprecedented, if we mean it literally, what we really mean is we've never had to deal with this before. So they've had to declare their first ever red warning for extreme heat in the UK. We have not had to deal with that before. We do not have the infrastructure and the designs to cope with those kinds of heat waves. This is just indicative of the changes we're having to deal with. And this is what is occurring right now, not what we might think may be happening in five to 10 years time or even further down the line. So there are many difficulties that we do have to recognize, adapt to and overcome. However, we are never alone in this. You never use an individual. We can all make a difference. And there's already been great work being done to recognize these challenges and to deal with them as well.
It's worth remembering, of course, as well, that at the very highest level of all governments with the international community, they have been coming together uh, first beginning in 1992 with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's when they realized this is serious. We need to get together, start knocking heads and start coming up with solutions. How do we deal with this? When they first began, the plan was they were meant to meet every five years. But as time went on, they began to realize this is really serious. This is a major uh, threat to our way of life, to our globe and to all nation states. We can't just leave it every five years. So now, since then, they have begun meeting every single year. You may have heard of COP26, COP27, COP28. They are now occurring every year because of the international community's recognition of how real and how present the danger, the effects of climate change are. Which is why we had a landmark example in 2015 with the Paris Climate Agreement, where 194 parties from all around the world agreed that this is serious and we need to keep the, limiting our temperatures below 2 degrees and ideally below 1.5 degrees. Might not sound like massive numbers, but those still in and themselves represent catastrophic levels of damage around the world. So there is an agreement, the international community, we need to work on this, we need to deal with climate change and avoid the very worst effects of it there. Which is why, of course, the last COP, the conference of parties that we had was held in Egypt uh, back in November of 2022, where again, it might not be flashy, it might not be dramatic, but those solid negotiations occurring every year with nearly every party in the world present, it's making small incremental gains where there was a recognition of at COP27 in Egypt, we need to establish loss and damage funds. This isn't even to prepare to, you know, deal with climate change or, you know, mitigate the worst effects of it. It's now actually a case of we're already being damaged so badly by climate change. We need to help and support people just to repair that damage, just to get back to zero. So progress is being made at the very highest level of all governments. And encouragingly as well, in the UK, they were very early, uh, very quick off the mark in introducing some of the world's first climate change legislation all the way back in 2008 was first introduced to begin recognizing the importance of reducing greenhouse gases across the board throughout the UK. And again, it was, it's continued to be updated as time goes by. In 2019, it was up to, upgraded to become a legally binding target so that the UK would reach net zero by 2050. What do we mean by that there? It means that they would reduce CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions as much as humanly possible. And then for that tiny amount that they just for the life of them can't quite get rid of, we need to then offset that with any form of carbon sequestering, be that fancy new technology or something old school like planting trees, which will then help sequester carbon back into the wood and back into the ground. That is the goal, that is the ambition, and that is what on the macro scale will help combat climate change. And as a function of that there, the UK also established the UK Committee on Climate Change, an independent advisory body that is monitoring the government's action to hold them to task to make sure they do what they say they're going to do. If you want to learn more, if you want to read their reports, they're all fully available on their website and they are invaluable for giving you some of the most up-to-date information of what is happening in the UK as a whole. But we in Northern Ireland, we are also making progress. There is good, important, encouraging, positive progress being made on climate change. The Northern Ireland Assembly themselves declared a climate emergency all the way back in 2020, and last year, with 2022, Northern Ireland also put into law its own Climate Change Act. So just like the UK, Northern Ireland has now said we will set a legally binding target that we will also reach net zero by 2050, meaning that we need to reduce our emissions as much as possible and what little we can uh, reduce, we then need to offset to avoid the very worst effects of climate change. And every one of us has a part to play in making that happen. It's not just in the big government departments, we as individuals can make a colossal difference in our own actions and what we can do within our communities to make that so. Which is why, just because it's in law, we then need to make it happen. That is why there's the ongoing green growth strategy out for consultation back again 
they are now slowly but steadily moving towards making the changes we need both on an economic and an environmental level so that we can meet that legally binding target of becoming net zero by 2050. So there are positive steps being taken at the very highest levels of government all the way down to our own local assembly as well. But like I say, they cannot do it alone. Every one of us needs to get involved and do our part to help reduce our own emissions and encourage everyone around us to do so as well then. And what I always like to encourage people and say to them is, every little bit helps. It's easy to get lost with all the big numbers that can come out with us here. I like to remind people that even just a few kilos saved it's all contributing to bringing us back from the very worst case examples of climate change. And again, one kilo of CO2 is still considerable, bigger than a child's head. And again, when I'm working with students, when I've been working with community members, when I see the efforts and pledges that they make to try and reduce their emissions, they can quite easily, just through a few basic changes in their lifestyle or how they do things, they can not just save kilos of CO2, they can save tons of CO2. It can be that easy. They can make such a colossal difference. And again, a visual illustration here, a ton of CO2 is bigger than most people's homes. It is a considerable amount, and every one of us can make that difference and help contribute towards it. So what does that look like for ourselves here in Northern Ireland then? So again, looking at specifics for ourselves here as well, we have many industries that are all, due to their operations, emitting some level of uh, either CO2, methane, or other greenhouse gases from agriculture, transport, energy supply, residential businesses, and so forth. These are just some of the figures associated with what we are currently emitting. We are not quite on track yet. We need to make considerable savings across every board. We can't just say one industry, you have to fix everything and the rest of us will be fine. Everything across the board has to be reduced as rapidly as possible to avoid the very worst effects of climate change. So every industry will need help and support and direction and guidance so that we can all make the changes needed to get us to net zero. So. It's important to remember as well then, this isn't a niche little topic. This isn't just a nice to know kind of thing. Questions and concerns around the environment are impacting every one of us in every aspect of our lives. As we can see from the Northern Ireland Environmental Statistics Report back in 2020 or 2022, it highlights that up to 82% of the public were concerned about the environment in one form or another, from illegal dumping of waste, climate change, pollution, biodiversity loss, People care. We value our natural world. We want to keep what we have. We want to preserve it, protect it, and keep establish more of it so that we can have more of it to enjoy in the future, as well as future generations. So people care. We understand what the problem is. Now we just need to get on with how we can try and fix that there. So again, we are all connected all around the world when it comes to climate change as well. And a key question, a key point as well then is every one of us can make a difference. Every one of us can make an impact. So how can it be solved? How are we solving it? As I was saying beforehand, governments from the very highest levels of international action down to national governments, down to even regional governments, they are doing their part. They are conducting their negotiations, putting things into law so that we can make our reductions to try and combat climate change. Businesses are doing much the same as well, even without government direction or push. Businesses we talk to, it go, the conversation frequently goes from is like, eh, even if we're not concerned about the environment, we can't pay our energy bills. We need renewable energy sources. We need to decarbonize our sources of energy because we can't afford to keep paying these bills as they currently are, never mind what they're trending upwards towards. They want guidance. They want direction. They want to make those changes. They just need to be shown where to go and how we can do that there as well. And as I was saying as well, education is so vital and important of this here. How can we make these changes? How can we hold governments to count and push businesses in the right direction if we don't know, learn, and understand more about the impacts of climate change? So that's why we are still continuing our eco skills program so that we can reach primary and secondary students all throughout Northern Ireland so that they can feel more comfortable learning about the environment and understanding climate change. But again, every one of us, part of every community that we have here, we can all make a difference from saving just a couple of kilos of CO2 here to saving 
hundreds of tons for changing our practices or how we do things, whatever it takes, whatever makes sense for you, we all have a part to play and we all can make a difference. And if we're to do that there then, it means it's important to understand these key distinctions then as well then. What we have to do today is we have to adapt. Again, these are not predictions, these are not projections. We are already dealing with the effects of climate change. We are already experiencing flooding. We are already experiencing drier summers. We need to adapt now. We need to make changes to our communities, the way we do things, just to protect and preserve what we already have. So we need to adapt to our circumstances as is now, but then thinking long term, even if we can protect ourselves for now, if we don't mitigate the effects, if we do not lower the amount of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases that we emit into the atmosphere, things are only projected to get worse and our defenses may become overwhelmed. So we need our adaptions, but we also need to mitigate the effects of greenhouse gases by reducing them so that we can protect our future for the long term. And what does that mean for us then? What does mitigation look like for us? It means working together to change everything we do in whatever way we can. Anything that is connected to fossil fuels, anything that emits anything with greenhouse gases, either directly or indirectly, whatever you can do to reduce that, you are making a difference. You are part of the solution to help dealing with climate change. And then to reduce greenhouse gases, if we can do that there, again, we are all connected. The impact, the differences you make here in Northern Ireland to reduce your emissions and your pollution, not only will that protect our local environment, but they will feed into the wider world and just be part of the solution to help solve climate change for everyone. I know I want to be part of that there, and I hope you want to as well then. So remember, remember I was alluding to the UK Climate Change Commission. They've been highlighting some of the critical areas that people can add put their efforts into to making a difference and reducing their emissions. They have a fantastic pie chart here that we use in all of our trainings that highlights key things. It's highlighting individual actions we can take, actions we can take in conjunction with wider societal changes, or and highlighting the areas that just need to be changed regardless of what we do. That could be me choosing to ride my bike into work rather than driving, that could be me being able to ride my bike because I've had a cycle lane installed that allows me to safely uh, go to work such as that there. Or lastly, regardless of what I'm doing, if there's a coal fired power plant that gets shut down and that's converted to renewable energy that allows us to still draw our power and still have our quality and standard of life, but without it being connected to greenhouse gas emissions, we're all happy and we're all better for it then. Key thing I always highlight and for every one of us here to remember is we have a say in all of that pie, not just our individual actions we make or the actions we can do take part in as communities, but what we ask and demand for as well. So remember, we have a say in the whole pie. And why do we care? Why are we doing these things? Is it just to be an inconvenience? Is it just to feel like doing the right thing? Remember, we want a better world. We aren't protecting the, these environmental habitats and this biodiversity just because it's something nice to look at or something we'll just keep in a terrarium. It's something that will benefit ourselves and for our children's and our children's children's generations for, to come. We want a safer, healthier, greener, better world so that we can all benefit for the, from this here then as well. So think of the positives, think of the future you want and realize the actions you can take today can make that happen and can make that difference. We love using this image here as well. We've often talked about the idea of carbon footprints. Every one of us, whether we want to or not, makes some impact through our lives and through our consumption as well. So every little thing in whatever way you can, whatever is realistic in your circumstances, if you can reduce your emissions, if you can reduce your resource consumption, you will help in some small way to tackling climate change. We have many suggestions here from using washing line, reducing uh, plastic usage, washing at 30 degrees, flying less if you can, how you engage with your political representatives, and just what active forms of travel we can do, use. Anything you can do to reduce your emissions and reduce your consumption levels, which makes up over two thirds of all emission connections, it all makes a difference. 
we all can make that impact. So as I always say to people as well, consider what small steps you can take in your circumstances, whatever is realistic for you. Whatever you can do, make it happen. Every little bit saved does make a difference in the grand scheme of things. And last but not least, think of the challenge, think of the games, and let's be brutally honest here as well. Many of the things I'm about to suggest to you here, it's not just about saving emissions. We're hopefully going to try and save you some money as well. And I think we all can agree that's vitally important these days here. So just a few key areas to suggest for you here then, the actions you could take today, right now, to, to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and to help do your part for, to combating climate change. One of the most important aspects as well is the sheer amount of emissions that are connected to heating our homes here in Northern Ireland, Ireland and the United Kingdom as well then. Up to 2.7 tonnes of, of carbon are emitted from a home every year. It's a colossal amount, but we need heated homes as well. It's important that we have that for our well-being. So what can we do in any way, small way possible to try and make that more efficient and use less energy and resources to do that? In whatever way you can, use less electricity, however that may be, from changing your light bulbs to LEDs to reducing your consumption levels, whatever works for you, anything you can do to reduce your electricity consumption will help reduce your CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases, and hopefully will save you a bit of money along the way as well. We all need a bit of that. But as well then, one way you can reduce your energy usage is if you don't have to use as much energy energy to heat your home in the first place. However, you can improve your insulation from double cavity walls, triple glazed windows, roof insulations, or even just a fuzzy draft excluder. Whatever works in your circumstances, it'll keep your home warmer, give you a more comfortable life and cost less to do so as well as help tackle climate change. And of course, we encourage people, whatever way you can, you can reduce your thermostat levels down. If you can find a safe, comfortable level for you to live at, while requiring less resources and energy, it all makes a difference. So that's one area that many people have been able to make considerable savings. Perhaps you could do that today as well. Furthermore, as well then, the average car in Northern Ireland emits over 4.6 metric tons of carbon per year as well. Every little bit you can do to try and save on travel and whatever your circumstances may be, it all counts, it all makes a difference. Active travel, be that walking, cycling, or being able to use public transport wherever is feasible for you. Every single trip you do that there, even if it's a little bit of a faff, a little bit of an inconvenience, it still makes a world of a difference. It still drastically cuts down your emissions and again contributes towards helping climate change. And again, I know we're stuck, at, we are on our island, so we don't have the same mobility options, but if you can fly less, or take other alternative means of transport, such as taking the ferries across or whatever, those are some massive savings to be made with uh, when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. If it's feasible, if it's realistic for you, make it happen and make those gains and make that difference today. And beyond that there as well then, we are close to our hearts here at Keep Nord Down Beautiful as well. We want to try and help tackle fast fashion as well then. In the UK, we purchase roughly two tons of clothes every minute at a cost of over 50 tons of CO2. We Don't get me wrong, we need our clothing. How much do we need? Are we being buried under the weight of our own consumption of, of fashion? Is there another way we can do things? We want to encourage people to be conscious consumers. Think about what you truly need, and if you need it, where's some of the best places you can, you can get it? Can you get it from charity shops or from online stores such as Vinted, Depop, or a new, whatever works for your circumstances, if you can get a hold of pre-loved clothing, not only going to get you something fashionable and much more cheaply as well, it all contributes to reducing that demand and again, effect, reducing the effects of climate change. And as well then, don't forget the old ways as well. If you've got something, if you can make do, repair and mend, not only will it reduce our consumption, it will save you considerable money, amounts of money as well then. Hopefully we can all find that agreeable. Hopefully we can find something there. And again, these aren't just theoretical, possible, nice to do's. They're real practical concrete tips that we can take today, right now, to make that difference to help combat climate change. Lastly as well, 
you are not alone. We are all in this together. We are all connected here in Northern Ireland, our, our, all our nation states and the entire world. We can all do our part and we can all help each other to do so as well then. Contact your local representatives, tell them what you care about and what you value and how you want to go about it then, using your vote, using your purchasing power, what you do and what we do as communities, it all makes a difference and it all feeds into helping to deal with climate change there. Lastly, of course, then, how could I possibly have this brief little briefing for you here today without acknowledging the fantastic work that Sir David Attenborough has done for highlighting the beautiful, wonderful biodiversity all around the world, but also the great championing he's been doing about the impacts of climate change and highlighting how we can all make that difference. So let me share this video with you just to conclude our briefing for today. We've worked out all the problems. We're working on all the solutions. Most of them we can do now. And over time, all of them help the economy. Our population growth is actually slowing down. And by the end of the century, it will plateau. There's never been a better opportunity to take control. The plan is obvious. Stop doing the damaging stuff. Roll out the new green tech and systems as they arrive. Stabilize the human population as low as we fairly can. Keep hold of the natural wealth we have currently got. And in 80 years' time, we'll be past the worst of it. More than that, we'll have built a world with eternal energy, clean air and water, a stable, healthy world that we can benefit from forever. So what's stopping us? This opportunity is out of sight. Each of us is blinkered by the demands of here and now. Big picture, long term, they're not in our field of vision. That must change if we're going to change. We now have the choice to create a planet that we can all be proud of, our planet. The perfect home for ourselves and the rest of life on Earth. We have a plan. We know what to do. There is a path to sustainability. If enough people can see the path, we may just start down it in time. Again, Hopefully that video has helped summed up all the key information we've been looking at here then today. We hope we've given you a little bit of context and understanding around what climate change is and what impacts it's having on us there. How the world itself from the very highest levels to even our own local government and our own institutions, how we've already been trying to tackle climate change and most importantly, what each and every one of us can do to help towards that there then as well. There's always so much to cover. We've only had a very brief bit of time here then today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got something useful or something you can do right now out of this here as well. But there's always more to learn and we would be delighted to keep helping you with that there as well. If you have any questions about anything that has come up here today or would like to know more about how you can learn more or get involved with our further training programs, please email us at carboninquiries at keepnordnarrowbeautiful.org. We'd be delighted to hear from you, and it's never one and done. We always want to keep working with our partners and keep working with people to make a difference and to help protect our local environment and the whole world when dealing with climate change here as well. So once again, thank you so very much for your time here today then. I've really enjoyed delivering this to you here as well. And again, we are incredibly thankful for our partners that have allowed us to be able to bring this to you here 
And we will continue running this here as well. If you know people that would be interested and you think this is an important message for them to hear, we will be running these briefings in the future as well then. Like I say, it's never one and done. Stay in touch with us and hopefully we can work together in the future as well. But for today, thank you very much and goodbye. And I'm very excited now to be joined by Dr. Tara Shine. Tara is the CEO of Change by Degrees, and she joins us here. She's a friend of the, the organization. Um, uh, Tara, it's always great to speak to you. So thank you for coming and joining us on your climate future. Um, Tara, my first question to you is, we're always intrigued, people who watch these type of sessions, about how people get involved in climate activism so what was there a moment for you that made you sit up and go great this is something i want to take part in oh yeah i think if you go back far enough david it would probably be in secondary school so i was in secondary school in the 1980s believe it or not and um at the time there was a lot of concern about um animal welfare and cruelty to animals associated with making cosmetics and lots of other other products it was also a time of heightened awareness around um whales and other cetaceans and the fact that they were being hunted to the brink of extinction so a couple of those issues really brought me close to environmental issues that's really what i was passionate about and that led to me setting up the first green club we ever had in my secondary school. And I guess that was kind of a, a defining moment in me kind of putting myself forward and saying, yeah, look, these are issues that are important to me. Okay. And uh, did you find that whenever you were setting up your, your, your green club in school, um, did you find that it was easy to get other people involved and bring people, and, uh, uh, just because you used the word club, I'm assuming there were other people in it. I mean, was it easy for you to, when you, when, when you walked around, Tara, was it easy for you to get people involved in it or, or, yeah. or did it take a bit of convincing? Yeah, it wasn't totally a Norman no mate, so that's good. Um, but yeah, no, there was, I wouldn't say back in the 80s, it wasn't, it wasn't where we are now, you know, Greta hadn't shown up and really, you know, um, you know, brought a whole community of young people behind these issues. And we really, it wasn't around climate, it was more on other aspects of environment. It was, this was when we were just starting to think about waste as an issue and recycling. And as I say, animal welfare, the ozone layer, which we know now we've made great progress on. Those were all the issues of the 80s. But yeah, there was sufficient um, interest by other kids like myself that were interested in these issues for us to, to band together and have a have a club that were able to actually bring about change within the school, starting out with, you know, things like waste and recycling. Um, but, you know, and then for me, that was really, really important that that act within school, when then I was doing my leaving cert and decided what I wanted to do in college. It led me, it led me down a path that helped me discover environmental science in Coleraine in Northern Ireland, where I went, where I went to university. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a, it was a very formative experience setting up that club because it let me see that these issues were ones I really did care enough. And then when I found that you could, it was something I could study as well and that it could be an academic career and a future career, that was all good news for me. Obviously, this has led you on to the career that you're in today. A lot of people uh, watching this will be will be very aware of your of your work. I just want to know a wee bit about your your journey through that. I mean, through, through, through the work that you've done, what has really leapt out at you about the state of our climate and what we need to do? Yeah, so I always I always think about this in a framing of fairness. So I think it is very unfair how we have treated um, mother nature um, in our desire as human beings to to be better off and to have more to have more stuff but i also think that the way that we've developed with this consequence of climate change and biodiversity loss is also very unfair to people and so for me right from its very heart this isn't an issue of environment separate to people it's very much around how we get people working together in a way that that yes people have the quality of life that they need but we also are looking after our planet and all the resources that we all need to live on so for me that's been a central framing all along and that was different when i joined the world of environmental science there was a very strong conservationist movement that believed that what you did is you kicked out the people and you created massive big protected areas and you just looked at them for nature only and i think that's evolved over time to be something whereby we realize that we really have to get nature and environment and environment and people working in harmony together to get lasting solutions 
And in terms of actually, because you, you've mentioned there about collaboration and something that we talk about all the time here at Keeping All Iron Beautiful. Do you think that in terms of getting that through, because, because quite often when we talk about the climate emergency and even the term itself, climate emergency, people can think, oh my goodness, this is so daunting. How can I make a difference? Where, where, where do you begin to even tackle it? What would be your, your sense back on that and your advice to someone who's thinking that? So I think the worst thing you can do in an emergency or in a crisis is feel powerless, feel overwhelmed, feel frozen with fear. So the very act of doing something about the climate crisis helps us to feel powerful in the face of this big, doomy, gloomy, massive problem. So and those things can be different things. So it might be that you decide you're going to cycle or walk to work every day. It might be that it might be that you're going to talk to people about the issue and tell them why it's important to you. It might be about how you vote. It might be about the clubs or societies that you enjoy, that you join as a young person or in your community. But the act of doing something um, is really, really powerful. So the worst thing you can do in an emergency is do nothing. Um, and what we actually saw in COVID as a time of an emergency is that you can actually do quite amazing things when there's an emergency. You can break what was previously a, a rule and not allowed a taboo and do things differently. And that's what we, we collectively need to try and find our way through in, in response to the climate and nature crisis, find new ways of doing things. And you can only start doing that by everybody doing something different, talking about the issues. Yeah, and obviously something that we are focusing on um, here is obviously locally. Um, a lot of people quite often who make the argument about, well, sure, we don't really need to do much. We'll make the point that this is a small island. You know, sure, 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 sure what harm uh, is this place doing? Sure, even if we did do a couple of things, it wouldn't make it a great, great overall difference to a global effort. Again, um, I appreciate I'm being a bit cynical in saying that, but, um, but, but what's your response back to that? Because it is quite often said. Yeah, no, I think it's a pretty common response. And I think we might be, uh, we might be small in number on the island of Ireland, but our emissions are really great per person. So we're some of the biggest emitters per capita in the world. We're, we're ultimately quite wealthy people compared to the global, the global context. And so when people are wealthier, they consume more. And when you consume more, you produce more, more, more pollution of all kinds, including carbon pollution. So our actions are actually really important. And in terms of the actual impact they have on reducing carbon. But beyond that, I think one another thing that we know about Ireland is in terms of our work internationally and our diplomacy, we really punch above our weight. So when we have a strong message to share around the benefits of climate action, the benefits of sustainable development, we have many platforms to share that from. And it's really inspiring for other small countries and bigger countries to see what what you know, small, brave, outward-facing um, societies can do, and that's a real opportunity for Ireland. And we'll be we'll benefit now in the short term and in the long term from that type of an approach. And also, because obviously you you see this, so what are the realities of climate change here? You know, what often I mean, there, there's the big misnomer of global warming, and you know, people thinking, well, sure, it's not getting anywhere, but people don't. Global warming means many different things. So what, how, what impact have you seen uh, here locally um, uh, with uh, climate change? So we know that globally we've warmed the atmosphere by about almost 1.2 de degrees, sorry, above what it used to be pre-industrial times. So that's back when we first started to, to burn coal kind of in the, the mid to late 1800s. So in that amount of time, we've warmed the earth by 1.2 degrees Celsius. How does that manifest itself? So it manifests itself in Ireland having the warmest year on record last year. It manifests itself in warmer winters, um, in warmer, wetter winters. So we're getting lots more rainfall in the winter time and it's falling differently. Most people have experienced this. Instead of those long, drizzly, soft days that we used to have, we're now getting a lot of intense rainfall events. They cause localized flooding, they cause soil erosion, um, they cause landslides. So we are seeing much more of that intense type rainfall, which wasn't typical of us in the past. And then we're seeing drier summers 
um, warmer summers, higher peaks of extreme heat, heat waves in the summers as well. So all of that has an impact on us. It has an impact on how we live, on how we go to work, on our productivity, on how we farm the land, and how our kids get to school, and how we arrange transport. So, so those are very real impacts. And whether it's because you know someone you know has had their house flooded, or as a as someone who works on the land, perhaps you've had a, a fodder shortage because the land it's been so dry and so so there's been so much drought in the summer. These are real world today examples of how um, climate change is affecting Ireland. And obviously, the big debate is from governments is about how we take action on this and how we actually um, uh, deal with this. So, what action do you think we can uh, governments um, can take on this in order to to make a difference? So. When we have things like the Paris Agreement, which I'm sure you, you and others will have heard about, David. So the Paris Agreement is the big international legally binding agreement amongst almost every country on earth around how we're going to get climate change under control. And the real power about those international climate agreements is that they translate down into national policy and law. Worldwide, we now have over 3000 national policies and legal instruments that are committing countries to taking actions to reduce their emissions but also to adapt to the impacts of climate change and the great thing about laws is that even if governments change the laws stay so it, it, it protects climate law and action from the vagaries of like political change and then what countries do is they once they have a law they have to figure out how to implement law and that's where typically countries are creating things like climate action plans policies that cut across different sectors that show how emissions are going to be reduced to show how we're going to start to manage the impacts of a changing climate um, and so whether that's in ireland or across the eu or across the uk we're now seeing national laws in place and then that being translated into actions and then what countries also have to do is report so report to internally to their own stakeholders to their citizens but then also report back also periodically to the international system around the progress that they're making and this increases transparency about what's happening and who's doing what and should give confidence to us as citizens that our government is doing what it said it was going to do and obviously a key audience um uh, for this are community groups um and uh, many of them are already doing phenomenal work but what in your experience tara is something that you know you were talking about earlier about not being uh not being overwhelmed and thinking that that you can't do anything so what what advice would you give for for where community groups and community activists can go in in in, in playing a part in this so i think community groups are amazingly influential and powerful in growing the conversation on climate change and you don't have to be an environmental be focused community group to do that you might be a group that get together to on um, history of your area or on wildlife, yeah, or on uh, tight, you know, having tidier towns as you're involved with uh, litter picking, waste, but it could be equally, I don't know, flower arranging or sports, anything. So anything where you have an organized group of people that come together because they have a shared interest, there's a relevance of climate to that shared interest and using your existing um friendships relationships the fact that you have something in common you trust each other to start to bring climate change into the conversation that you're having is really 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 powerful so i would say number one is start to talk about it and think about what you can do take find one or two actions that you might all enjoy doing together try that see how you can link with other community organizations maybe don't do it on your own think about even unlikely organ you know think about crossing the line between if your community group has a lot of older people in it, how could you um, partner with a, a community group that has more young people in it to make a difference? If you know there's a skill set you're missing, look for that skill set within another group. Um, but the fact that you're there, you exist, you have some funding, you're organized means that you're a really important player. And obviously, um, something uh, that we also focus on um, with community groups and individuals is, is behaviour change and by doing things differently. What's your own experiences of, uh, of doing that, Tara? Do you have any kind of uh, top tips um, that you've used that may, that, that, that may be useful for some of the people listening into this? Yeah, so behaviour change is massive in actually bringing down emissions. So sometimes when we're talking about emissions reduction, we're actually talking about 
renewable energy and retrofitting houses and changing the transport system. But actually, if you look at the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so when all the scientists come together to talk about climate solutions, for any of these to work, we have to have societal engagement and we have to change behaviour. So the key thing about behaving, changing behaviour is you need the leadership there. So you need things like those laws and policies that, I, that we spoke about. You need the infrastructure there. So if you're going to switch out of your car um, to a different form of transport, you need there to be good public transport or good cycle paths or good paths just for walking on, those types of, that type of infrastructure. And then you need the motivation. You need to be, have a reason to care. So what's going to get you to take that step to stop taking perhaps what was the most convenient option of the car outside your door? Say, no, I'm not going to take the car today. I am going to go take the bus or I'm going to cycle. So that motivation, why is it is important to you? And that may not be about tons of carbon. It might be about clean air because you have a kid that has asthma, or it might be because you really need to work on your own physical health and you need to get a bit fitter. Or it might just be because you've set yourself a goal of doing a triathlon and this is a way of getting extra training. And, you know, whatever it is, you figure out what the motivation is for you. Um, and then we have to find the pleasure in behavior change. So some behavior changes are, are hard. But some actually make things better. And essentially, it's about changing habits. So I thought loads and loads about this in the book that I wrote, How to Save Your Planet One Object at a Time, which is all around help, helping people change habits and behaviours in favour of less um, environmentally impactful ways of doing things. So don't just go for the biggest, hardest thing first. Think about doing it in degrees of change. Yeah, so think about um, what, what can I try out first and feel some success with it and have a good story to share with others, because I'm, ultimately my biggest impact is when I get other people also to, to change their behavior and then work your way up. Some things that we can change our behaviors on in our lives are, are literally small issues of habit. They might even save us money. Others require an investment, you know, if it's going to be to save up to buy a, an electric bike or an EV or change something in our house, we might need to actually save up for that. So that might take a little bit longer to get to. But there are plenty of things that you can do every single day, whether that's, you know, not filling the kettle every time you boil it for two cups of tea so that you're saving yourself money, number one, in, in terms of energy, but also then producing less carbon emissions or just always remembering to have your keep cup with you when you're out and about so that you're not adding to the, to the waste mountains. Um, you know, these are small things, small new habits that each of us can can take on that are that are ultimately make life better. So, Tara, obviously, you, you mentioned motivation. There. So how are you applying this in your own daily life? You know, because obviously it's very it can be a bit daunting as the where to get started and how to actually put that in practice in your own home. So what advice would you give to people who maybe want to do that? Yeah, so find something that matters to you. So it might be going back and remembering all that you learned from your mum and your granny about how to fix things or how not to waste any food. That might work for you. Uh, for me, I love swimming in the sea. So a big motivator for me is that I continue to have a safe, clean sea for me and my kids as they grow up uh, to swim in. You might be into fishing, you might be into cycling, and you're just sick of seeing all the litter in the in the in the hedgerows as you're going along. So what what's your motivator? What are what are you into? You might be an artist, and you might want to um, bring you know this care that you have for the environment into into your art, and that use that as a way of communicating it and and helping others to get engaged too. We have to find something that that you like, or it might just be like yeah, you you've a kid with asthma and you just can't handle the the impacts of air pollution anymore or you're a farmer and you really want to work with other farmers to reduce the amount of nitrate pollution in the water because you you also love fishing you know and you want healthy rivers and streams to be able to fish in and um, so it does have to be absolutely personal and if you're stuck do some reading um you know books like my one give you heaps of ideas of simple things you can do uh, and if that doesn't work for you get involved with a group of people that are that are you think are like-minded to you and that you might be able to get ideas from Tara, that's really, really helpful. So my last question to you is, if you're a community group or an individual starting out on this journey and you, you've, you're maybe just getting together, or maybe you're looking to take, to take your activism to the next level, what advice would you give? Because obviously this is something that you've done throughout your career of, of, of in terms of building that platform. What advice do you give to, to, to those individuals in those community groups? So my biggest piece of advice is think about who you have influence on. 
So uh, each of us is most influenced by the people we trust, the people we have relationships with, and um, much more so than an expert or a politician or anybody else. So think about how you can use that influence for good. So who's who's hearing you? Um, uh, where are you speaking up? How are you influencing those that that trust you and that you have relationships with? So if you're a community group and you already have a reach across your community or trusted, you've worked hard over the years to really deliver for your community and you have that trust, then think about are you talking to them about about climate change? Are you talking to them in about it in a positive way? The worst thing you can do is go out with like a big doomy gloomy message. It doesn't work. You need to say, here's a real opportunity. Here's a thing we could do. Here's a way we could set our community apart. Here's something that would make life better for people in our community. So really make it hopeful um, and then really use that influence that you already have. And that's the biggest, most impactful thing you could do. Okay, and that's a really hopeful message to end on. Tara, thank you so very much uh, for your time. If anyone wants to uh, follow Tara's work, you can go to your website, www.tarashine.com, for more information. Thank you so much for such an insightful interview. Thank you, David, very much. And that brings us to the end of the time that we have for this session. Uh, can I just thank you, um, Tara, for your insights and for sharing um, uh, your experiences. It really has been really helpful. And there's lots of food for thought there to take away um, uh, for all of us as well. Can I also give a thanks to Richard Gilmore, our Climate Action Officer, for a really on point and interesting presentation. Um, if you want to find out more about the Carbon Literacy Programme, you can visit our website, www.keepnorthernirelandbeautiful.org. If you want to keep up to date with everything that Tara is doing, she is on uh, social media. If you just search uh, Tara Shine, uh, you'll be able to come across all of, her, all of her wonderful work. That just leaves me to say thank you to our climate action team here at Keep Northern Iron Beautiful, and also to our sponsors, the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And also thank you to you for watching. <laughs>